Hello and welcome to this last lecture in uh, the PDEs module. Uh, in the previous lecture, we had used Microsoft Excel to look at uh, hyperbolic and parabolic PDEs and how to solve them using the forward in time central in space method. Uh, so, we were on hyperbolic PDEs. And the example for hyperbolic PDE that we use was a partial C by partial T plus U multiplied by partial C by partial X equal to minus K C to the power 1.25 at the initial condition C at T equal to 0 equal to 1 and uh, the initial condition C at X equal to 0 also going to be equal to 1. Okay. So, this is uh, the problem that we intended to solve and what we did was we used forward in time central in space differencing and we saw that for a small enough delta t of 0 0.1 still this particular method diverged we got concentrations as negative values. So, next what we are going to do is we will, we will use uh, an upwind scheme because u is a positive value what that means is that it is going to be backward and uh, sorry it is going to be forward in time and backward in space. So, upwind differencing of the of this particular PDE is going to lead us to C i comma k plus 1 minus C i comma k divided by delta t is going to be equal or plus u multiplied by backward difference that is going to be equal to C i comma k minus C i minus 1 comma k divided by delta x is going to be equal to uh, minus k C i comma k to the power 1.25. Okay. Uh, then what we will do is we will multiply by delta t throughout take these guys all on to the left hand side uh, as a result of this what we are going to get is C i comma k plus 1 is going to be equal to uh, we have minus k delta t multiplied by C i comma k to the power 1.25. Uh, these guys taken to the left hand side will yield us minus u delta t by sorry the yeah by delta x uh, multiplied by c i comma k minus c i minus 1 comma k okay and this guy when we take that to the right hand side we will get this as c i comma Okay, which we can write this as C i comma k multiplied by 1 minus u delta t by delta x okay, minus k delta t C i comma k to the power 1.25 plus u delta t divided by delta x multiplied by c i minus 1 comma k. Okay. This is going to be our upwind differencing scheme. Okay. Now, the stability of the upwind difference scheme actually depends on the value of u delta t by delta x and as before uh, as we had seen in the parabolic PDEs uh, with respect to alpha delta t by delta x squared what we see in this particular expression also is that we need to satisfy the condition u delta t by delta x the absolute value of that should be less than or equal to 1. So, that is the overall condition u delta t by delta x should be less than or equal to 1 is the overall condition that needs to be satisfied. So, as we have done before we will take the velocity u equal to 1 delta x equal to 1 uh, 
delta t equal to 0 0.1 with this it satisfies that this particular value is less than or equal to 1. Keep in mind that the presence of this non-linear terms does complicate the stability results quite a bit. Uh, so, uh, the stability results are essentially derived as a uh, without uh, consideration of this non-linearity, this non-linear term that comes in over here. So, if it was a homogeneous PD, we are guaranteed to have stability if u delta t by delta x is less than or equal to 1, else we will have the overall system to be unstable. Uh, so, let us try this particular uh, example now with the upwind difference scheme. We will start off with what we had uh, previously using the forward in time central in space method and then modify it appropriately for the upwind difference method. Okay. So, let us start where we had left off in the third lecture of this module. We will start off with the hyperbolic PDs uh, solving using the FTCS method. So, if we go to excel now. This was uh, the excel sheet that we had obtained in the previous lecture using hyperbolic PDE solving using the FTCS method. What I will do is I will right click on this, click on move and copy, I will create a copy and what I want is I, a hyperbolic equation using upwind difference. Okay, nothing else actually is going to change over here in all these blocks. What is going to change is really everything from this point down. Okay. So, what I have done is I have deleted all these values this point down and these are the initial conditions our concentration was equal to 1 and these are our inlet conditions again at the inlet the concentration was also equal to 1. Okay. Now, with the upwind difference scheme what we have is C i comma k plus 1 is going to be equal to. Okay. So, what we will do in this case now we require u delta t by delta x not by 2 delta x. So, that is what we are going to compute. I okay. will press F 2 and I will remove this part over here. So, now what we have is u delta t by delta x. Okay. So, what we will do now is C i comma k plus 1 is going to be equal to C i comma k which is this guy multiplied by 1 minus u delta t by delta x. Okay, and I will put dollar signs. Okay. This guy minus k multiplied by delta t multiplied by c i comma k to the power 1.25. This is again c i comma k to the power 1.25. And now, because when I drag and drop this k value and this delta t value is not going to change, I need to go back and put dollar signs at appropriate places. So, we have k multiplied by delta t with the dollar signs there multiplied by concentration that is c i comma k to the power 1.25. Okay. And the final term is going to be plus u delta t divided by delta x multiplied by c i minus 1 comma k, c i minus 1 comma k is this guy over here, c i minus 1 comma k and I do need to put uh, dollar signs for our u delta t by delta x term okay? and that should do it. I will just quickly go on to the board and show what the, the expression once again. We just want to confirm that the overall scheme that we have obtained is indeed in the excel that we have written down is indeed what we had before. So, c i comma k plus 1 is c i comma k multiplied by 1 minus that u delta t by delta x term. This is what we have computed separately minus k delta t multiplied by c i comma k to the power 1.25. Okay, so, if we are computing for one particular, so if this is a part of our excel sheet where, where we are computing for the various location and various times, 
if this is our c i comma k plus 1 this guy is our c i comma k and this is c i minus 1 comma k. So, we have c i comma k multiplied by 1 minus uh, that particular coefficient minus k delta t multiplied by c i comma k to the power 1.25 plus that coefficient multiplied by c i minus 1 comma k. So, let us go back to excel and check that this is indeed what we have obtained. So, let us press F 2 again and check that that is indeed what we have obtained. So, we are up, you, you trying to compute the value for this particular cell using values at these two cells. We will press F 2 now and we have the concentration in the upper cell multiplied by 1 minus that constant which is over here minus k delta t that is that is the k value that is the delta t value multiplied by the concentration in the upper cell to the power 1.25 plus we had that particular coefficient that coefficient again comes with dollar b dollar b dollar 4 signs that is over here multiplied by concentration in the upper cell, but one cell to the left and that is what we have over here. Okay. So, this is essentially what we are going to get and uh, and I will just press enter and I will drag it along this particular row. Okay. So, now what I will do is I will highlight this entire thing and then double click and I will see that our solution indeed is stable. This particular solution is indeed not unstable and our concentration is decreasing both with length as well as with time. So, I think we will need to go a little bit beyond time 5, maybe we will go up to say time 10. So, this is the overall concentration along the length of the reactor at time 10. We have started along the length of the reactor the initial conditions at all the concentrations equal to 1. As before, let us go and make a plot insert for plotting this particular guys, we will highlight these two rows and press on scatter. Okay. So, as the length changes our initial condition is that the concentration is all going to be equal to 1. I will delete this, I will, I will as before increase the fonts, so that everything is readable okay. and I will delete this grid lines and I will just make this particular guy a little bit shorter. Okay, now, select data and we will add data at time 1, 2, 5 and 10 let us say or 1, 2, 3 and 10 maybe and I will select the concentrations along the length of the reactor. Sorry, I will select the concentrations along the length of the reactor as the y axis. this is the x axis the concentration along the length of the reactor are going to be the y axis and that is at time 1. I okay. will add one more series and that is going to be at time 2 the x axis data remains the same the location along the reactor the y axis data will be the data at time 2. Okay, and this is going to be how the concentration changes in the reactor with time and space. So, this is the concentration at the initial time t equal to 0, this is the concentration profile that we get at t equal to 2, this is the concentration prof sorry t equal to 1, this is the concentration profile we get time at t equal to 2, this is the profile at t equal to 3, and this is what we get at t equal to 10, and it has converged, and this is essentially going to be our steady state concentration profiles in our PFR transient PFR. Okay. Now, let us go, a, go and change our delta t from say 0 0.1, we will change this to 0 0.2 and when we change this to 0 0.2, again we find that the solution has still converged. Okay. That is because uh, delta t u delta t by delta x is still 
going to be less than 1. Now, let us change our delta t equal to 2 and when we change our delta t equal to 2, what we see is really uh, what we are getting over here. If you see over here is that the temp it is the concentration at time 6 has become negative and uh, and in uh, indeed the concentration at location 4 at time 10 has is minus 50, this is minus 150 and minus 400. So, what we can see over here is that when the delta t is fairly high at that time our overall solution is going to diverge. Likewise, the solution will diverge for another value of delta t say if we take delta t as 1.5, if we take delta t as 1.2 again we are having our solution diverge, solution is diverging a little more slowly when our delta t values are, uh, are closer to 1, but when our delta t values are farther away from 1, our uh, overall scheme diverges very quickly. Now, when our delta t value we take less than 1 again say 0 0.5, finally we will get our system to converge in uh, quite soon. Okay. So, the overall take home message over here is that upwind scheme indeed is able to solve the hyperbolic PDEs. Uh, the high upwind scheme is not a globally stable scheme, we have a range of delta x values and delta t values for which the overall upwind scheme is going to be stable. Okay. So, let us now go and recap what we have done so far and the overall methods of solving uh, uh, hyperbolic, parabolic and uh, as, as well as elliptic PDEs. We will just recap all these methods and finish off uh, the this, this particular module. So, what we have done in today's lecture is uh, taken a look at hyperbolic PDEs, but instead of using a central difference scheme for dc by dx, we have used a backward difference scheme for dc by dx. We use a backward difference scheme because u value was positive if u is negative, we will use a forward difference scheme for d c by d x. When we did that and when we substituted all these guys in this overall, overall equation, this is the final expression that we obtained and this is the expression using the upwind difference scheme for hyperbolic p d s. Okay. Uh, exactly in the same way for parabolic p d s, we can indeed use a central difference scheme for d square c by d x squared. And the reason for that is that indeed hyperbolic PDEs are going to be unstable for uh, FTCS method, whereas parabolic PDEs are going to be stable for FTCS method under certain conditions. Okay. And the conditions that we had obtained okay, FTCS method is stable if 2 alpha delta t by delta x squared is going to be less than 1. For parabolic, FTCS is globally unstable. which means that you cannot use the FTCS method, whereas the upwind scheme is stable if u delta t by delta x value is going to be less than or equal to 1. Okay. So, this, this were the conditions that we obtained for the uh, I am sorry, I have exchanged hyperbolic and parabolic over here. Parabolic hyperbolic, okay. And for both these schemes, both sorry, both the parabolic and hyperbolic systems we can use either implicit method or crank nicholson method
the implicit and the crank nicholson methods are be, uh, going to be globally stable methods what i will sh just show you is what expression we will get if we were to use implicit method for the same hyperbolic pd that we have over here in case of an implicit method instead of ci comma k plus 1 minus ci comma k we are going to use ci comma k minus ci comma k minus 1 divided by delta t so that is the only change that is going to happen. So, C i comma k minus C i comma k minus 1 divided by delta t plus we can we will retain central difference in uh, in space. So, we will have u C i plus 1 comma k minus C i minus 1 comma k divided by 2 delta x equal to minus k c i comma k to the power 1.25 okay and what we then need to do we'll multiply by delta t throughout t and then bring this guy on to the left hand side and that will actually yield us c i comma k uh, plus k delta t we will move to the left hand side so we will have plus k delta t multiplied by c i comma k to the power 1.25 plus u delta t divided by 2 delta x multiplied by c i plus 1 comma k minus c i comma sorry c i minus 1 comma k is going to be equal to 0. Okay. Now, this is an implicit expression, it is an implicit non-linear expression or non-linear equation in C i comma k where i goes from 1 to n plus 1. So, we will have n plus 1 equations in n plus 1 unknowns which we need to solve simultaneously. So, this particular equation becomes the ith equation f i in x bar where and I will use a capital X bar over here rather than a small x bar, where x bar is going to be equal to c 1 comma k, c 2 comma k and so on up to c n plus 1 comma k. Okay. So, what happens is that at each time what we will have, if you are going to use either an implicit or a crank Nicholson method, at each time we have to solve f bar of x bar k going to be equal to 0 bar. We can solve this using say the Newton Raphson's method. And we can keep repeating this at every iteration at every time step in order to finally, get the overall solution for the various concentrations c as a function of time and space. At each time when we solve this equation, we will get concentration c uh, along the length of the reactor at that particular time. Then we go on to the next time, we get the uh, concentrations along the length of the reactor at the next time, so on and so forth. Okay. So, that is essentially what we are going to get by solving uh, this particular equation using implicit method. Uh, so, this is the term c i comma k over here. C i comma k multiplied by k delta t, we have moved on to the left hand side. Uh, this is a term that I have missed out actually. So, this, this particular thing is a little bit incorrect. I do have to incorporate that term also minus C i comma k minus 1 equal to 0. Okay. So, this is how the overall expression is going to look like. Now, if we go on to look at our map in Microsoft Excel that this is the kind of map we had obtained where the starred species uh, or sorry the starred value we were getting it from the two values above, but instead if we are going to make the same kind of a block for this system over here. Okay. 
and this is the star is the value that we are interested in finding that is C i comma k. Now, C i comma k depends on C i comma k itself. So, I will put a dot in this particular block okay, as well as it depends on C i plus 1 comma k. So, it depends on this guy it depends on C i minus 1 comma k which basically means that it depends on this guy as well as it depends on C i comma k minus 1 which means it depends on this guy. Okay. So, when we are using a central difference scheme in a space and we are using a fully implicit method the value of star depends essentially on the values at the same time and the values at the previous time as well. Okay. So, this is the overall uh, uh, linkage of any cell in the Microsoft Excel is uh, what we are going to get whereas, in an explicit method the values at this cell are only linked to the values at previous cell which values we already know. As a result the explicit methods are much more easier in uh, to solve using uh, any of the standard techniques the implicit methods are that much more difficult to solve the advantage we get with an implicit method that is that, that the implicit methods are going to be globally stable. Okay. Now, we will go on to one final aspect of solving PDEs uh, using uh, what is known as the method of lines. I okay. will mention that just for the sake of completeness. method of lines is applicable for hyperbolic as well as parabolic PDEs, it is not applicable for elliptic PDEs and the idea behind method of lines is that you have for example, dou c by dou t plus u dou c by dou x equal to minus k c to the power 1.25. The idea behind method of lines is discretize in space only. And when you discretize in space, our PDE gets converted to ODE in time. What I mean by that is, is as before we just discretize C in terms of C1, C2, C3 up to Cn plus 1, we do not discretize this in time. So, when we discretize this in space for at any location i. at any location i what we are going to get is d c i by d t is plus u multiplied by c i minus c i minus 1 divided by delta x is going to be equal to minus k c i to the power 1.25. Okay. We will be able to write this for all of the locations. Uh, in case of location 2, we will have C i minus C 1 sorry we have C i minus uh, C 2 minus C 1 and C 1 is going to be given to us as C 1 was equal to 1. So, we would not actually use n plus 1 equations in n plus 1 unknowns, we will actually use n ODEs in n unknowns and we can then solve the n ODEs in n unknowns. So, what we will define our x as x we will define as C 2, C 3 and so on up to C n plus 1. Keep in mind C 1 is going to be equal to 1. So, C 1 equal to 1 is not an ODE, it is an algebraic equation. So, we would not involve C 1 in this particular equation uh, in this particular scheme and when we define this we are going to get d x by d t is going to be equal to some g of x bar. Okay this dx dc by dt depends on ci and ci minus 1 only as a result this g of x bar in in each of those uh, g of x bars uh, c ci is going to depend only on those two components so this is the overall ode that we are getting so from the pd we have finally gone to ode and this ode we can solve it using any of the o
we can solve it using any of the ODE IVB methods. For example, we can use a fourth order Runge Kutta method, so that we get a lot of accuracy with respect to time and then all we need to worry about is essentially the accuracy in the x direction, uh, the small x direction, the uh, accuracy in the spatial direction. So this is the final method, again we are not going to solve a problem using the method of lines. Uh, however, um, I wanted to state this because it is an important method for solving uh, uh, PDEs. All that we have done is using the same ideas as before, the, the concepts from uh, numerical differentiation, we have implemented that over here. Uh, using that, we have converted our uh, overall PD into ODE and then we can use any of our ODE solving techniques. So what I just wanted to spend the next 15 minutes or so on is just to give an overview of everything that we have covered in uh, this particular lecture series. Module 1, we had just looked at introduction and basically what, what we did was the definition of the computational techniques that we use was the computational techniques or the numerical methods, we are going to solve the problems using stepwise repeated or iterative methods. As you have seen for example, when we talked about PDEs in today's lecture, uh, what we see, saw over there is we found out how to get values from initial time 0 to time uh, delta t at from the solution at time delta t, the same expressions we use to go from delta t to 2 delta t same expressions we used to go from 2 delta t to 3 delta t, so on and so forth. So that method was a stepwise method, it was a repetitive or an iterative method that means we use the same set of equations, in this particular case it was a repetitive method that means we use the same expressions in order to get the values of temperature or the values of concentration at the new time along the length of the reactor or along the length of the rod. Now these particular problems, for example, the linear example that was there, the, the heat loss from the rod are very much solvable by hand because analytical solution exists, it is a linear equation. But the problem of the nature that we saw in today's lecture, they are uh, quite difficult to solve by hand because of the non-linearity associated with c to the power 1.25. You can indeed solve this problem still by hand, but for example, if you had to solve this coupled with the energy balance equation, we get the Arrhenius term e to the power minus e by rt that becomes extremely difficult to solve by hand. Uh, so if you were to use a calculator and do all these punching in the calculators, it is going to be very tedious in order to use the calculator and it is going to be unsolvable by using some of the analytical techniques. So what these computational techniques allow us to do is use the stepwise and repetitive procedures in order to get the final solution that we desire. Okay. And uh, the, we went through the historical perspective using the Babylonian methods for solving uh, 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 the problem of getting square root of 2, that is what we did and uh, finally we talked about errors and in case of errors, we talked about precision, accuracy and the number of significant digits and the most important thing basically we talked about the difference between the truncation errors, round of errors and where exactly this truncation and round of errors appear because of and we talked about the finite precision algebra and the binary number systems and that is uh, essentially what we covered in the second module of this particular lecture series. Okay. Uh, and Taylor series expansions is essentially if you, uh, if you have gone through all the lectures, you will realize that Taylor series expansion is something uh, that appeared again and again in most of our derivations, either in the derivations or uh, in finding out the error analysis for that particular system. Okay. That is what we did in modules 1 and 2 and in module 3, basically we talked about the linear equations, linear equations. Uh, we before going to that, we did a quick recap of linear algebra and linear equations, we get a geometric interpretation saying that the linear equations involve nothing but uh, intersection of two lines. We put the linear equations in the matrix form as we have shown over here and then we uh, used various numerical schemes to solve the equations Ax equal to B. Okay. 
and the reason to put it in this general form a x equal to b is so that we can come up with a numerical scheme which is going to be independent of the number of equations, the number of unknowns so on and so forth. And the methods that we, we saw in this particular module is basically uh, the Gauss elimination method and we did analyze this Gauss elimination method and said that the computation effort is of the order of n cubed. We talked about the Gauss Jordan method and Gauss Jordan method we said was a very useful method if we want we were interested in finding out the matrix inverse. So, Gauss Jordan method is very useful for the matrix inversion. LU decomposition method is another method that uh, that we talked about okay. and then we went to the iterative methods for solving uh, linear equations, the Gauss Seidel iteration, the Jacobi iteration then we talked about under relaxation and over relaxation methods. Okay. Eigenvalues and eigenvectors, we did not cover numerical methods to get eigenvalues and eigenvectors, but we went over what the physical meaning of the eigenvalues and eigenvectors was. And after that, we went uh, to solving nonlinear algebraic equations and the idea of nonlinear algebraic equations is given a function f x equal to 0, we want to find out the values of x that satisfies the equation f x equal to 0. Okay. And the procedure that we used and for example, in this particular example, these are the two points at which uh, this curve intersects the x axis and these two points are the solutions of f x equal to 0. We saw various methods to solve the problem f x equal to 0, all these methods uh, would obtain one solution at a time, we will not get both the solutions simultaneously using any of the methods that we spoke about. Okay. The general strategy we used for solving the nonlinear equations is we started with some kind of an initial guess, we either started with one or two initial guesses based on the method we use for sol uh, solving. Based on this method for solving, we use a chosen strategy in order to move hopefully in the direction of the solution. So, we will move from this initial spot to this new spot uh, using our chosen strategy. If this spot, uh, this new uh, solution is close enough to the true solution, we can find that out by, uh, by couple, of, couple of methods seeing how much the new solution has deviated from the previous solution. If the stopping criteria is satisfied, we, we say that this is going to be our solution. If the stopping criteria is not satisfied, we repeat this particular procedure iteratively till the stopping criterion is satisfied and that is when we have obtained the solution. The methods that we have used were categorized into two types of methods, one was the bracketing method and we saw two methods for bracketing method, one was the bisection and the other was regular falsy method. The bisection method we saw was a linearly convergent method that means error in i th iteration depends linearly on the error in i minus 1th iteration. The regular falsy method was super linear which means the error in i th iteration dependent on error in i minus 1th iteration to the power 1.5 or 1.6. Uh, then we looked at various open method, the secant method uh, is also a super linear uh, uh, method, the fixed point iteration is a linearly convergent method and the Newton Raphson's, Newton Raphson's we saw was is, uh, the reasons for Newton Raphson's to be the most popular method and specifically the reasons are it is a second order convergent method is the first reason and the second reason for the popularity is that it is very easily extendable to uh, multiple equations in multiple unknowns, multiple equations in multiple unknowns. Then we discuss modifications and extensions to the Newton Raphson's methods particularly, but also to the other methods. And finally, we talked about the Bayer-Stowe's method for finding out the roots of a polynomial. So, if we have an nth order polynomial, the tenth order polynomial has n roots, which we can find using methods, uh, various methods and uh, a popular method is Bayer-Stowe's method. And after that, we talked about regression and interpolation. The idea behind regression is that given x and y data, so this is uh, one sample data the idea behind regression is uh, to fit a line or a second order curve in or which best fits the data. Okay. 
So, we decide what is the kind of functional form that uh, this curve is going to have and then we are going to use various techniques in order to find the best fit curve. That is the idea behind regression. The idea behind interpolation is to find a smooth curve that can pass through all the points, all the data points that we have. Okay. The difference between regression and interpolation is that the regression is trying to fit a function to the various data and it is ok if there is an error between the function and the data. The objective is to minimize this particular error. The objective in interpolation is that the curve should pass exactly through all the points that we have been given, so that we can find out the values at any of the intermediate points. For example, if we were to find the value at x equal to 2.5, we can get this particular functional curve and then just read the value of y at this particular point. Okay. So, that is the idea behind interpolation. Then after that we took a couple of examples of for regression, we said that for example, if we were to find the kinetic rate constants our k 0 and the activation energy and concentration to the power if it is concentration to power alpha then that alpha value also. In that case we can take a logarithm and convert it into a linear regression problem and this becomes our y, this becomes our a naught and uh, uh, this becomes our x and this becomes our a 1. And then we can solve this particular linear regression problem in order to get an approximate straight line fit as we have shown over here. Okay. So, this we could we termed this as a functional regression, we get a functional form and convert that particular function in such a way that we can use a linear regression technique. After regression we went on to uh, differentiation and integration, uh, numerical differentiation and integration. We interpreted the numerical differentiation as nothing but finding slope of a tangent and then we said that the differentiation dx by dy by dx can be approximately written as y i plus 1 minus y i minus 1 divided by x i plus 1 divided minus x i minus 1. This is exactly what we have used in the forward difference scheme in today's uh, in today's lecture. Uh, we did not use the forward difference indeed, we used the backward difference scheme uh, in case of uh, spatial derivatives. So, we had y i minus y i minus 1 divided by delta x. In case of time derivatives, we, uh, we used y i plus y k plus 1 minus y k divided by delta x. Okay. And the idea behind this is that we need to choose our delta x or our delta t values small enough such that delta a or delta y by delta x represents as closely as possible the true numerical derivative. Okay. So, these were the concepts from numerical differentiation that we actually imported into the PDE solution techniques using the finite difference method. And in the integration the idea is that given a curve f of x dx we want to find the area under the curve which basically is integral from a to b f of x dx. So, the shaded area is really the area under the curve and the solution to that integration problem. Okay. Then talking about the numerical differentiation we look at the forward difference, the backward difference, the cent central difference scheme and we saw that the forward and the backward difference schemes for finding uh, uh, df by dx were order h accurate, whereas the central difference scheme was order h squared accurate. And we saw what that means when we were talking about the partial differential equations solution to the partial differential equations. And then we talked about a three point forward difference, three point backward difference formula as well, where instead of using x i plus 1 x i and x i minus 1 instead we use x i plus 2 x i plus 1 and x i. Likewise in backward difference we will use x i x i minus 1 and x i minus 2 and those methods were h squared accurate. We then also looked at the various ways of getting the higher derivatives the second derivatives using the central difference scheme and indeed central difference scheme for second derivatives was something that we used in the previous lecture for solving parabolic PDEs uh, in, uh, in a single variable. And what we also covered was how the round off and truncation errors change with the step size and here is was the plot of the actual total error using forward central and uh, three point forward difference scheme. And then we saw, uh, saw that epsilon to the power 
1 by 2 was the best values uh, of delta x that you can take for a forward difference scheme and the best value of delta x to take for a central difference scheme is epsilon to the power 1 third and that is what this particular curve shows over here the trade off between round off and truncation errors. Okay. And then when we went on to integration we looked at the various integration formulae and the integration formulae was the trapezoidal Simpson one third and Simpson's three eighths rule. The trapezoidal is very popular because it is a very simple way of applying uh, a the numerical integration scheme it is order h cubed accurate. So, the accuracy is not bad at all for the trapezoidal rule. Uh, after trapezoidal rule the next very popular method is Simpson's one third rule because it is h to the power 5 accurate, but it uses only 2 intervals. Simpson's 3 eighth rule uses 3 intervals, but it is still h to the power 5 accurate as a result of this we did not use the Simpson's one third rule or Simpson's one third rules use is not as popular as the trapezoidal and Simpson's one third or the three eighths rule sorry is not as popular. And then we talked about the Richardson's uh, extrapolation and the Richardson's extrapolation is that you use uh, two techniques using uh, two different values of h uh, and uh, based on this particular equation you can get a slightly higher accuracy method using the Richardson's extrapolation. And finally, we covered Gauss quadrature method which is an open type of a method and the idea behind the Gauss quadrature method is that given this particular curve when you want to find the area the shaded area and the integral from minus 1 to 1 that is going to be a weighted sum of the function values at specifically chosen location. Module 7 and 8 were ODE solu solving techniques and the idea behind ODEs was that given f of x uh, f of y comma t as the slope of the curve y versus t we want to find the values of y how the values of y change as the time t increases. And this was wa all that we covered in ODE initial value problems uh, we, we covered the Runge Kutta family of methods. Uh, we talked about explicit versus implicit method we used higher order Runge Kutta method. We spent a fair amount of time on RK2 methods specifically the midpoint method and the Ewens method looked at error analysis and stability of these methods. We said essentially that the implicit methods are going to be globally stable whereas explicit methods are not going to be globally stable. Uh, they have a range of delta t values for which the explicit methods are going to be stable. After that we went to the predictor corrector family of methods we took the Ewens method which was a second order uh, second order accurate uh, method and modified this in a predictor corrector form and finally talked about the Adam Moulton's family of methods. Uh, these were the various three different classes of uh, methods for sol solving ODE IVP and then we took we specifically in the last two lectures of this module I think lecture. 8th and 9th of this particular module. Uh, we covered adaptive stiff sizing and solving multiple ODEs using stiff ODE solvers. Uh, the whole idea behind this was to give uh, you an introduction to some of the various advanced techniques that are covered in ODE IVP methods. So, what we did in the ODE boundary value problem was to cover what is the difference between the initial value problem which is hinged only at one initial condition whereas a boundary value problem which is hinged at both the boundaries and uh, that is uh, how we motivated our boundary value problem. And then we solved the boundary value problem using two different methods one was the shooting method and the other was the finite difference method. Okay. And in the shooting method what we did was we covered the initial value problem uh, the boundary value problem into an initial value problem and solve the initial value problem along with a Newton Raphson's type of a technique in order to get the final solution. And in finite difference method we converted the boundary value problem into linear or non-linear equations. And finally, in this particular current module we have covered how to solve partial differential equations specifically classified PDEs into 
uh, hyperbolic, parabolic and elliptic equations and saw the various methods of solving these PDEs. Okay. So, that is really so, that is really the overview of what we have done in the last 40 lectures and this particular lecture in, in our computational techniques lecture series. Uh, what uh, I invite you to do essentially is go over and solve the various problems that we have solved using the Microsoft Excel, solve them yourselves. Uh, so, that you can get acquainted with the various numerical techniques. The really the only way to get acquainted and get comfortable with numerical uh, techniques is through solving the problems uh, and we will have several problem sheets and problems are there, good problems are there in the various textbooks and the various sources that I have recommended specifically the textbook by Chapra and Canal on numerical methods for engineers and the book by uh, Professor S. K. Gupta again numerical methods for engineers. Uh, specifically, uh, Professor Gupta's book is written by a chemical engineer for chemical engineers, although it uh, has it has various other problems also in it. Okay, so hopefully uh, you have gained a fair amount of uh, initial knowledge about computational techniques in this particular lecture series. Uh, and that will hopefully give you the confidence to look at the more advanced techniques that you would be using either in your uh, research or in, in your job wherever your job takes you. Okay? Thank you and thank you for listening to, our, to these lectures.